Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamancy. Tonight, a sweeping government warning. Don't leave the country. All travel outside of Canada to be uh, considered high risk for Canadians. Limiting flights bound for Canada, closing schools, daycares, even Parliament to try to stop the spread of coronavirus. What is spreading? Panic. I saw people with like five, six packages of toilet paper. When stocking up leads to hoarding or worse. And that fear is driving hundreds to get tested, overwhelming the system. Patients cannot just come in walking in for testing. Who really needs the test and why you should stay out of the ER? Cases soar in the U.S. I am officially declaring a national emergency. Two very big words. As the U.S. president ignores his own public health advice. This is The National. COVID-19's impact on Canada is getting wider. The number of cases nearly 200 so far, and its impact on our lives, our communities, and our work is already massive. The concern now that this outbreak in this country has only begun. I know that you're worried. You're worried about your health, about your family's health, about your job, your savings, about paying rent, about the kids not being in school. After a week of chaos from the stock market to supermarkets, the federal government says help is coming, but also advises Canadians not to leave the country unless absolutely necessary. And as the Prime Minister remains in isolation, tonight we'll look at Ottawa's plan to control the spread of the virus and to support the economy, including the growing list of restrictions and cancellations and how panic is making a hard situation even harder, from grocery stores to diagnostic testing. Considering how quickly things are changing, many of you are on edge and have lots of questions. Well, today we got some answers and warnings today from the federal government. David Cochran begins our coverage from Ottawa. The Prime Minister is fighting this virus on three fronts. His family's health, the health of Canadians, and the health of the Canadian economy. We will be supporting uh, the economy and Canadians through this time. Because his wife tested positive, Trudeau will work from isolation as his government tries to stop the contagion. Today my advice is to postpone or cancel all non-essential travel outside of Canada. No Canadians should leave the country while the government will limit the ways travelers can enter the country. International arrivals from certain regions will land only at a few specified airports. This will enable us. To, to concentrate our, our precious resources for our border services officers and for our public health officers. Cruise ships are banned until at least July. They won't be allowed to go to the Arctic at all because of the lack of health facilities in the north. The border, however, stays open. As evidence shows, a border shutdown doesn't work. I think what we have to remember is that viruses don't know borders. A border is not going to contain the virus. Parliament, though, is closed until late April. MPs of all parties not wanting to be part of the problem when they visit their ridings. We go back and shake thousands of hands. And then 338 people go back, shake thousands of hands, and come back together here, together in the same space. There's the risk to the community, but also the economy. On that front, a highly coordinated response from the country's top financial officials. Cutting interest rates for the second time this month. Letting banks tap reserves to free up $300 billion for loans. And offering $10 billion in credit directly to companies. All backstopped by the promise of much more to come. A significant stimulus program to be released next week to stabilize our economy, to support businesses, and to protect Canadians during a difficult time. That will include cash transfers to Canadians as people and the economy adapt to the new restrictions being deployed. It's a significant escalation in the national response and it's nowhere near done because the virus is nowhere near reaching its peak here in Canada. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Now, while the Prime Minister today said he feels fine, he also said he has no plans to be tested for COVID-19, which has many people asking, why not? Trudeau said his doctors actually advised against testing since he is showing no symptoms. And his health minister, Patty Haidu, pointed out a little later, that is the normal protocol. There is no 
evidence that someone needs to uh, self-isolate if, in fact, they have been in contact with someone who is asymptomatic. Okay. And so it's, import and it's important to remember that. That is why the Prime Minister has received that public health advice that he doesn't have to have a test. Haidu also said the Prime Minister's wife, Sophie, will be extensively interviewed as health officials attempt to trace everyone she has been in contact with. That major travel advisory is hard news for many Canadians who planned a trip during March break, and now they worry they could be out thousands of dollars. Cameron McIntosh takes a look at that part of the story. It's just directing you to a lot of government sites. Nothing He's really taking the advice, that. but all day, like thousands of other Canadians, Mike Brown just couldn't get through. Yeah, look, it's ticking away, connected, but it's dead air. Trying to cancel the trip he was supposed to take to Costa Rica tomorrow uncertain he'll recoup the $6,000 cost. It's really frustrating. I mean, I've, I, you'd like to have some faith in humanity and that they'll do the right thing, uh, especially with the feds coming out with, you know, advising people to not travel internationally. Uh, we f kind of feel like we're uh, handcuffed a bit here. Tonight, Sunwing says he'll get a credit. It's one of several tour providers and airlines, including WestJet and Air Canada, revising cancellation policies in the wake of the government's advisory. Non-essential international travel. Travel agent Cindy Godet watched it all closely, fearing the government would ground planes or shut the border. We really expected a hard decision today, which I'm happy there's no hard decision. Her office is dealing with cancellations, rebookings, and getting people home. Quarantining passengers. For Many now facing questions about quarantine, even where they may land. As I get home, I'm going to be in my house for two weeks, and I guess I'll just be reading some books and waiting it out. Meanwhile, Canada's busiest airport was nearly empty, unheard of on the Friday before Ontario's March break. But some people are still traveling. Michael Jane and his father off to golf in Orlando. It's kind of a bummer if I want to cancel it. So we've been plan planned for about a two months now, so yeah, we're going. Any traveler leaving now may return to a different situation. For now, Quebec and BC are ordering all returning travelers isolated, while Ontario is ordering all returning children isolated. Measures other provinces aren't ruling out. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. It is important to point out the number of cases in Canada is still quite low compared to other affected countries. Here's what the situation looks like tonight. Canada has now recorded at least 193 cases, the biggest cluster in Ontario with 82, including 19 reported today. That's followed by BC with 64, 11 announced this afternoon. Three of those employees at a North Vancouver hospital. So that's a wide picture of how COVID-19 is affecting the country, but crises like these always hit hard close to home. Seems like every hour now, another local event or service is canceled or suspended. We asked David Common to do some inventory. Ordinarily, two million people use public transit daily to commute in and around Toronto, but these are not ordinary times. By mid next week, ridership is projected to be down a third at least. Service will be reduced as Canadians hunker down. That's kind of scary now to think about it. There's a lot of people impacted. Well, it's fine. Most companies make you work from home nowadays too, right? We've agreed to close the New Brunswick Public Schools, effective Monday, March 16th. Meanwhile, schools are now out in New Brunswick, Ontario, Quebec. The second possibility is to Many universities and colleges and now daycares too. With few other options, Canadian parents may have no choice but to work from home or not at all. If it seems like an overreaction when all this is done, it just means that it probably did what it was supposed to do. For some parents, reducing contact is about reducing risk. I think the social distancing idea is a good one for slowing down this virus, and, and particularly in terms of what we, what we know about it. The closure list is long. Toronto's Royal Ontario Museum joins Halifax's Pier 21 as most other museums nationally shut down. Ottawa hardly alone in shuttering pools and rec centers. Courts either stopping or limiting trials. Concerts and symphony performances postponed. Cirque du Soleil shows stopped. All of them ended for three weeks with the knowledge it could well be more. An effort to limit the spread. For some, this will be deadly serious. For others, it's an inconvenience. 
or an opportunity. I got to go to my grandparents. An advantage to Canada's closing down. David Common, CBC News, Toronto. The impacts of COVID-19 are also stretching to more than 50,000 employees of the Ontario Public Service. The province has asked employees to work from home beginning on Monday until April 3rd if feasible. This follows a vote at Queen's Park to suspend the spring legislative session temporarily. The Tories are also determining whether to postpone the March 25th budget. Another senior Canadian politician went into isolation today. PEI's Premier Dennis King says that he'll spend the next 14 days at home after travelling to Boston with his family earlier this week. In a statement, King says he and his family aren't experiencing any symptoms and believes their risk of exposure to COVID-19 was very low. While some public places have been thinning out, grocery stores are jammed with customers. They're loading up with supplies to make sure they don't run out. And in the process, emptying the shelves. Tom Stagler went to find out what's fueling this panic. On a quick trip for essentials, good luck. Consider this coronavirus fueled panic buying. Empty shelves, lineups that keep going and going and going. Excuse me, sorry. Not to mention a tight squeeze in that crowd, even as public health experts urge everyone to avoid contact. Yeah, it seems rather a little bonkers in there now today. There's lots of people and more than normal, even on their busiest day. I saw people with like five, six packages of toilet paper. Indeed, with so many users sharing pictures online showing toilet paper shelves empty, unfounded fears of a shortage run rampant. Toilet paper isn't the only thing running low in some stores like non-perishable food items, tomato sauce, and pasta in this store, it's nearly all gone. But stores are restocking every day, and officials across the country promise... Right now, all trucks are delivering goods, and uh, we don't expect uh, any shortage. So what's driving the panic? This medical anthropologist blames the fear of a mysterious virus and the need to do something to help. Hoarding behaviors uh, in the context of an outbreak are not helpful. Problem is, overbuying prevents others from grabbing their own supplies. But it gets worse, like those reselling cleaning wipes online at outrageous prices. I'm profoundly disappointed in people who are hoarding and then selling online. I, I, I think that's just offensive. Grazie mille. And don't forget, even in Italy and other countries worse hit by COVID-19, stores selling essentials remain open while everything else grinds to a halt. In Canada, stocking up may be helpful, but buying all in sight makes a crisis worse. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Here's another way widespread panic can harm your community. People who think they might have the virus are showing up at hospitals and assessment centers when they really shouldn't be there. Christine Burak shows us why that's a problem. They're lining up, masked and worried they might have the virus. Inside, there's no waiting room. A registered nurse is screening patients to determine if they need to see the doctor. Yesterday we saw about 170 patients and today it looks like a lot more. But most of them were turned away. Doctors are seeing patients based on risk factors, not fear. Well, I think there's a tremendous level of anxiety um, and I think uh, we're trying to uh, control that anxiety as well. There's already a lineup of cars trying to get into this assessment centre and doctors inside say they're not just swabbing everyone. Health right, officials warn their supply of testing swabs is limited. Turns out Italy is a major supplier and the country's been locked down by a coronavirus outbreak. Today the city of Ottawa did a dry run of drive through assessments and opened a larger centre, but there are rules. Uh, patients cannot just come in uh, walking in for testing. If they do, we tell them to call public health and get direction from them and we send them home. At the same time, public health call centres are being overwhelmed. Wait times are over an hour. There are obviously a lot of people who are concerned about potentially having uh, COVID just on the basis of their travel history or exposure. 
Before making that call, some health officials are asking Canadians to go online, find out who's most at risk and who's eligible for a COVID-19 test. We have a website, the federal government has a 1-800 number. Do not phone 811 unless you have traveled outside of the country and have developed fever or new cough. Rules vary by province, but doctors warn, much like an MRI scan, not everyone who wants a test needs one. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, ready for some more practical advice? Let's bring in infectious disease specialist, Dr. Michael Gardam. And Dr. Gardam, the danger here, as we saw, is that people who aren't infected would, will overwhelm the system. So, so how can people assess their symptoms at home to, to figure out what to do next? Yeah, really, it's about, you know, how sick are you? And so, you know, obviously, if people have difficulty breathing, very high fevers that aren't breaking, if they're so tired or weak that they have a hard time getting out of bed, those are all symptoms that we say, you know, you really should be going to see a doctor. Uh, but, but for very mild symptoms, if you come and see us, there's no, there's no specific treatment for this. So we're just going to send you back home again. So it's really about how sick you are. Now, there are people who are in the so-called compromise group or they're looking after someone who is. Is the criteria different for them? Uh, no, not particularly. I mean, it really comes down to if, if, if people are ill enough or if there are other extenuating circumstances, when they go to an emergency department, the doctors may decide to test them. But by and large, we're still testing largely based on, on travel to, uh, to other countries. So a quick question here, if you're not sick enough to go in, you don't have the symptoms you mentioned at the beginning, uh, but you're still feeling, you know, what might be the cold, the flu, you're not sure, what do you do then? Yeah, the message there is the same one we've been saying for years, which is stay home, and it, we really mean it this time. Uh, nobody wants to see you at work walking around coughing, so you need to stay home until you are feeling well enough to go back. I like that. We really mean it this time. Dr. Michael Gardam, thank you. Thank you. Around the world, the number of COVID-19 cases continues to climb. As of this evening, more than 142,000 people have been diagnosed with the virus. As the world hits a grim milestone, more than 5,000 deaths. Some good news, though, more than 70,000 people have recovered. In the United States, more than 1,200 have been diagnosed, 43 people have died, and six have recovered. Those numbers may go up as the United States improves its testing process, something Donald Trump announced today when he declared a national emergency. The CBC's Katie Simpson has more from Washington. The president and his coronavirus team are significantly ramping up the fight against the disease. Thank you very much, everyone. I am officially declaring a national emergency. Two very big words. The, goal is the announcement unlocks $50 billion in federal funding and allows for better coordination with state governments. The Trump administration is also partnering with the private sector to get more Americans tested, promising to set up new drive through testing sites like the one that just opened at the center of the outbreak in New York State. And this... This new approach to testing, which will start in the screening website, an online survey patients fill out to see if they actually need to be screened. We don't want everybody taking this test. It's totally unnecessary. Uh, and this will pass. Donald Trump appeared to contradict his own advice, saying he is likely going to be tested even though he doesn't feel sick. Thank you, sir. And repeatedly ignored the advice of experts by shaking hands with several of the speakers at his news conference. Great job. Thank you very much. The president has been criticized for appearing not to take the crisis seriously. Okay, I like that. And for responding slowly. The U.S. has struggled to test large numbers of patients because of flawed testing kits, a lack of supplies, and strict regulations. The system is not really geared to what we need right now, what you are asking for. That is a failing. Even if it is a failing, Trump says it's not his fault. I don't take responsibility at all because we were given rules, regulations and specifications from a different time. Lawmakers are putting even more resources into this fight, agreeing on new legislation that guarantees testing is free, some workers get paid sick leave, and kids who rely on school meal programs will continue to be fed even if classes are cancelled. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. In Europe, efforts continue to combat the spread of the virus as the World Health Organization called the continent the new epicentre of the pandemic. 
In Italy, officials recorded the highest daily death toll yet. 250 people have died in the last 24 hours. That brings the total to more than 1,200, with nearly 18,000 infections overall. A nationwide lockdown continues with all shops closed except supermarkets and pharmacies. In Spain, the Prime Minister announced a two-week state of emergency. The goal is to mobilize the military and other resources as the number of infections jumped to 4,200 with 120 deaths. The announcement allows the government to limit free movement, legally confiscate goods, and take over control of industries and private facilities. And the Olympic torch relay is on hold because of concerns around coronavirus. It started yesterday at a pared-down ceremony, but Olympic officials suspended the remaining stops after a large crowd turned out for the opening leg in Greece. The flame will still be handed over to Tokyo 2020 Games organizers in Athens on Thursday, but no spectators will be allowed. So maybe you're one of the many Canadians who's facing self-isolation, and that means a few adjustments. Make sure you're not sharing any dishes with anyone who's sick or may be infected. From cleaning counters to clothes, the do's and don'ts of self-isolation. Plus... I am concerned for my community and, and what this will do over the long term. The case for containment, Seattle versus Vancouver. How COVID-19 is playing out in two close-by West Coast cities. Cancelling prayers and reducing services. The challenge of keeping the faith in the age of COVID-19. We're back in two. Welcome back. All through the coronavirus outbreak, skeptics have downplayed the dangers, but a simple graph has been driving home the need for preventive measures. This curve represents the growth in the number of COVID-19 cases over time. And this dotted line represents the healthcare system's capacity to treat cases. Now, without precautions, those new cases pile up fast, exceeding the capacity of the system. But if people are cautious, new cases increase more slowly, and the system should be able to cope. One of the methods to slow the spread is self-isolation, but... It doesn't always mean locking yourself inside a sealed chamber. For example, you saw the Prime Minister standing outside his residence, a safe distance from the media that was gathered there. But what if you have to stay home? Ellen Morrow shows us what precautions to take. More and more people are in self-isolation at home, either because they have the virus, worries they could be carrying it, or as a precaution. This is what you should do if you find yourself in that position. First things first, you're not leaving your home unless you need medical care. Don't go to the store, get on public transportation, in a taxi. You're staying inside. If you live with others, you need to keep your distance from them. You should also stay away from any pets you might have. Stay in a separate room, use a separate bathroom if possible, and if you are in the same space, you should wear a mask and they should also wear gloves. Keep any interactions limited and you should stay at least two meters apart. You or if there's someone else in your home needs to be disinfecting regularly touch surfaces as much as possible, so counters and taps, and make sure you're not sharing any dishes with anyone who's sick or may be infected. For laundry, officials say there's no need to separate people's clothes, but they should be handled with gloves, and you should use the highest temperatures possible. Afterwards, you need to wash your hands with soap and water. You should be doing that frequently, as well as monitoring your symptoms. And since you must limit your interactions, keep in touch with your loved ones through your phone. You also need to keep busy. Many people will be working from home. You could also do that task you've been putting off. Read a book, watch a new show. Mental health is important. Make sure you're taking care of yourself. You might need to get creative. Use a grocery delivery app or have your friends drop things off outside since you can't go to a store. Anything you can do to keep yourself away from others as much as possible. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. That was impressive. Just ahead, she spearheaded BC's response to the coronavirus pandemic. Dr. Bonnie Henry on how all the news this week literally kept her up at night. 
Last question, you said things are changing so quickly here, day to day, so maybe not a fair question, but what do you think is next? Yeah, so what do I think is next or what do I hope is next? <laughs>
And if we do these things and we do them earnestly and, and zealously, we will get through this. That is the message on both sides of the border. It's not every day that a provincial health officer becomes a household name, but here in BC, Dr. Bonnie Henry has emerged as one of the faces and calm voices of this pandemic. Day after day, Dr. Henry has been out front, guiding British Columbians with facts. Columbia, the risk still remains very low. Humor. Uh, wash your hands like you've been chopping jalapenos and you need to change your contacts. <laughs> and compassion. I went through SARS. I've been through Ebola. I've been through um, the, the pandemic in 2009. And I just know how stressful it is for our healthcare system, for our, my colleagues, and for families. Yesterday, she announced some significant changes. Uh, we are advising British Columbians against all non-essential travel outside of Canada. We are directing all event organizers in British Columbia that uh, they will be required with, to cancel any gatherings larger than 250 people. I spoke to Dr. Henry earlier today and started by asking about the sudden increase in restrictions really came down to feeling that we that the changing situation globally the changing risk um, that it would be better to go too soon than too late and if we went too late and didn't protect people we would never be able to recover from that a lot has been emphasized about what we can't do or shouldn't do here we are on a friday night heading into a, a saturday what can we do yeah, so that's it. We, we, we want to find that balance of protecting people as best we can and protecting our communities and particularly our seniors and elders. But we need to live life and society has to go on and we want to minimize as much as possible the disruption. So there's lots of things we can do. We're not closing down society and we're not closing down outdoor things. I mean, this is a perfect time to go walking in the park, <laughs> go with your, with your kids, go, go skiing, go um, visit ski hills, go to restaurants, go out. Um, but just be mindful and if you're not feeling well yourself stay away and stay away from people who might be more vulnerable this is a time where we do have some transmission here in BC we have some transmission in our communities so people who are older who have underlying illnesses need to really consider about going out in a crowded place and that's what some of these measures are to try and reduce that crowding you said earlier that better to be too early on some of these measures than too late. How would you assess as of right now the level of risk of transmission in British Columbia? Yeah, right now and most of BC, our level of risk is quite low still. Still quite low? Still quite low. We have some community cases that we have not yet traced back and figured out where they are, but small numbers. And we're doing a lot of testing, so we have a pretty good idea. Having said that, you know, the testing is, is getting near its maximum and it's challenging and we, have, we still have quite a lot of people who are sick. Some of the other things in, that we were thinking about, you know, March break starts today at the end of the school day today for many kids and it's for the next two weeks and a lot of people were planning on travel and that concerned me particularly if we were traveling to places where we now know there's a lot more risk than we realized even a day or 24 hours ago. So uh, the impetus really for, for making these decisions yesterday was so that people were aware of these things when they went on travel. They could reconsider whether they wanted to go to places, um, particularly because the risk is changing so quickly everywhere in the world. Last question, you said things are changing so quickly here, day to day, so maybe not a fair question, but what do you think is next? Yeah, so what do I think is next or what do I hope is next? <laughs> yeah, we're in this for an, another few weeks at least, um, given what's happening globally. Particularly, I'm worried about what's going on in Europe, and we're now seeing seeding of countries in, in South America and other places that we haven't seen before. So it's not over yet by any means. I'm uh, hopeful and we will continue to do as much containment as we can in BC, but I s expect that we'll have more community transmission. I hope that we'll be able to slow it down and keep it so that our, our healthcare system is able to manage and able to look after everybody else who has their health issues as well. Um, but I think we have a number of weeks before we can really predict what this is, what this is going to look like. Well, you've done a very good job in getting the message out, so thank you very much. Thank you. Public health officials have stressed the importance of hand washing, but that may be nearly impossible on some domestic flights. I kind of felt like I was riding in a, a porta potty <laughs> in the sky kind of thing. What's missing from some of Canada's major carriers? 
and later schools out. The pandemic has some of Canada's largest universities cancelling in-person classes. We'll look at the implications for students. Coronavirus concerns have forced thousands of travelers to cancel their flights. And for those who are still flying and want to keep washing their hands, well, they'll have a problem doing that on many Canadian flights. CBC News has found that many planes don't have running water. Dave Seglins investigates. March break travel season. But what to do amid all the warnings about coronavirus? The most important thing everyone can do is wash your hands. But that's not possible aboard some Canadian flights. Ken Walker flew home from Halifax Wednesday on Air Canada. The washrooms have a shelf where a sink would normally be, but instead of a sink, they just have hand sanitizer. Not good enough, he says. Well, I think a sink with running water and soap would probably be effective on an airplane. I kind of felt like I was riding in a, a porta potty <laughs> in the sky kind of thing. Heather Butt of St. John's took to Twitter after her flight Wednesday. Just returned from vacation via Air Canada and the last leg of her journey, she wrote, didn't even have water in the teeny tiny washroom. CBC's found many smaller planes don't have running water. WestJet has 47 of these prop planes without it. Porter Airlines, their entire fleet of 27, same problem, leaving travelers facing tough choices. I made sure I used the sanitizer and pretty thoroughly. Absolutely not, I wouldn't go on there. <laughs> no, I work in a cafe, so I'm used to wash my hands every 10 minutes, so if I didn't have access to that, I'm no chance. Air Canada, WestJet and Porter all say they're providing hand sanitizer or wipes if running water's not available and meeting all requirements. This microbiologist has studied hygiene on airplanes. He just arrived home on a flight from Florida. Well, yes, yeah, certainly uh, hand washing is the key thing. You know, more than hand sanitizers, more than anything else. But he says airplane washrooms present a risk, water or no water. It's a very uh, unusual environment. A lot of people closed in. And when you go into the washrooms, uh, as you'll know, it's very cramped. In actual fact, we found E. coli and all kinds of things on the latch uh, into the bathroom and out of the bathroom. And so he tries to avoid airplane washrooms altogether as the airline industry grapples with this COVID-19 crisis. Dave Seglin, CBC News, Toronto. Coming up, how a lockdown country is fighting the coronavirus with pots and pans. <laughs> Italians break the silence of their quarantine in our moment. For days now, universities and colleges have faced growing pressure to protect students and staff from potential exposure to COVID-19. Warnings about large gatherings have finally pushed many to take action. Deanna Sumanak-Johnson shows us the impact on campus life and studies. On a windy Friday, this University of Toronto campus is not exactly buzzing with student life. For the next little while, it will only get quieter. Today, Canada's biggest university, along with many others across the country, made the decision to cancel all face-to-face -face classes and move them online. I think it's a pretty good idea, you know, uh, social distancing is pretty important right now to contain the virus. There's a lot of repercussions of this decision that are definitely a little bit stressful in terms of like labs and midterms and finals. Most students say they understand the decision, but many challenges lie ahead. Universities are not closed. Students like these who live in dorms and eat in cafeterias will still be facing crowds. Even like eating in the residence dining hall is definitely going to be something that's changing for us. Laurentian University was the first to cancel in-person classes after someone who works there contracted COVID-19. They have encouraging words. The classroom experience is, is actually been transitioned over uh, quite effectively and, and that's working very well. I think where, where we do still have some challenges that we have to work out uh, is courses that include laboratory experiences uh, or courses that have uh, placements. For example, we have some clinical placements in nursing. This higher education consultant says that for all the talk of preparedness, universities are scrambling. You know, in some cases you're going to see classes simply cancelled, right? The, the professor is just going to say, email me, the, email me your last assignment and that's it. In some cases you're going, to have, you're going to be seeing a professor just use Zoom or Microsoft Teams or even Skype uh, to talk to students. 
It's complicated for sure, but universities are under pressure to protect people. As for the students, some see a silver lining. They're canceling our midterm, so that's something. Um, there's a little bit of good coming out of it. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. So for the most part, clearly a stressful time. Some Canadians are turning to their faith for comfort, but as the CBC's Allison Northcott tells us, worshippers are having to adapt to new limits on public gatherings. At this Montreal mosque, extra precautions and a careful headcount. We try to respect the consideration which is being delivered by the government to not have more than 250. The Canadian Council of Imams recommended cancelling Friday prayers and some mosques did. Those coming here say they are being cautious. The brothers, like, they made special efforts to clean up everything that is touched by multiple people. This Toronto synagogue says services will continue for now while practicing what one rabbi calls social distancing with spiritual nearness. The Catholic Archdiocese of Montreal and Toronto asked their churches to cancel Sunday Masses. Only smaller weekday services will go ahead. The number of people who come here are quite less, so I feel it's all right for me to come, just one person. The Montreal Diocese says funerals, baptisms and weddings can still be held with limited attendance. The Mass is the community celebration. The At Montreal's St. Baptism. Joseph's Oratory, where pilgrims normally come by the thousands this time of year, all Masses are cancelled with some held online. It was a very difficult decision because the uh, celebration of the Eucharist, the Mass, is really the, the core of our prayer life as Catholic. And uh, to, uh, to abandon this is very painful. In Rome, one cardinal planned to close 900 churches until the Pope warned against drastic measures. In Greece, there's been heated debate around the Holy Communion, where many worshippers use the same chalice. Faith strengthens your immune system, says this worshipper. If you really believe, you won't catch it. This man says having faith is good, but it's not going to save you from a virus. Some say these days their faith is especially important. I think it's going to help us and uh, go through everything we're going through in there right now. And say they will find ways to practice it throughout the crisis. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. As we've seen in recent days, the coronavirus has forced Italy into lockdown. The streets eerily quiet. But then, come evening, something happens. The air filled with the sound of defiance. It's in our moment, and that's next. Italy has been hit hard by COVID-19. The death toll is increasing. The streets often eerily empty. But through it all, Italians are finding ways to keep their community spirit alive. They're opening their windows and singing with and to each other. Tonight's song, Italy's national anthem, this cross-country show of solidarity is our moment. Did you see that kid put his hand over his ears? I think that was a scene just a few seconds ago, but still, what a perfect Italian way to bring community together and uh, celebrate in the midst of, of that huge lockdown. And although we are nowhere near the situation in Italy and certainly no lockdown here, maybe that's your challenge for the weekend to come up with some social distancing way to kind of bring the country together in these times. That is the national for March 13th. Have a good weekend. Good night.